All right. Good afternoon to everyone that is connected right now. We hope you are doing well. Uh, we're going to get started in just a few minutes. Um, and I'm going to, in the meantime, put a poll for us in the chat so we can have a little bit of interaction going on here. You're also welcome to utilize this chat as we go today during the event. Uh, We'd love to hear from you, see where you're at. I believe we actually have one of our students here today that is currently in Kenya attending uh, because they are on mission trip. And so shout out to Ken, if you are connected, we hope you're doing well. All right, here is our first poll. What is your prior experience with utilizing AI. We've got some answers already coming in. Is it no experience? You really don't know much of what's going on. That's why you're attending today. Uh, maybe you have some experience. You've probably had some experience without even realizing, like maybe asking Siri for directions. So maybe you've had a little bit. Uh, maybe you have used it in a ministry context before. Uh, or maybe you're a pro and you're just attending because you're like, man, I love to nerd out on this stuff and I want to hear more about other people that love talking about this. <laughs> it's good to see we've got some people, a lot of people adding some experience that seems to be at about like 47%. Welcome Nadine and Jerry, Grace Community. Thank y'all for being here. St. John, thank you for being here today. All right. I'm going to leave it open for a few more seconds on the poll. Again, if you want to answer that, feel free to. And uh, your prior experience with AI. Hi, David. It's good to see you. Clarence, good to see you. And James, Larry. Man, this is awesome. Hello, Donald. All right. I'm going to go ahead and we're going to wrap up this poll here. And that way we can go ahead and get started with the event. So thank you for attending today. Welcome to our AI Toolbox training for the church. We are thrilled to have you join us for today's session. I know AI has been a big topic in the news and virtually in every field of work you can think of. And so we are glad you're here today about this subject so we can talk about it as well as to show you some helpful tools that you can hopefully put into place immediately while doing ministry work. So I'm going to introduce you to our presenter today, uh, Dr. Chris Stapper. If you are a student at Stark, you likely have met him before. So Dr. Stapper serves as our Vice President of Mission and Finance here at Stark. And he is also a faculty member that typically teaches our youth ministry course, as well as courses in leadership studies. And the reason he is the perfect person to present on this topic of using AI in ministry is because he himself is a minister. He is currently the pastor at Third Coast Church here in Corpus Christi and has had years of experience uh, serving in various administrative and pastoral roles within a church setting. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Chris Stafford. Go ahead and take it away. Excellent. Thank you, Cheryl. That was a, quite an introduction. Perfect uh, person. Man, that's a, that's a lot to live up to. So it's, it's going to be fun. We're going to dive right in and we're going to talk a little bit about AI overall and uh, kind of some of the maybe concerns or questions that we might have even getting into this. We're going to uh, talk about live demonstrations and look at some ways that you can actually use it and give you a whole bunch of different ideas that you can use in order to take advantage of these AI uh, tools. And so as we get started today, um, I'd love it if you would do this because one of the things about what we'll be talking about is you can follow along as we go. And so if you will create a free account at both of these sites using ChatGPT, which is chat.openai.com, and at Claude, which is another 
version of a chat and, and I'll explain more about that in a moment. Um, it's good to have two different uh, options. Sometimes one may be down, sometimes one might give you better results than the other. Uh, but I, I'd love it if you'd create the free accounts. And by the way, they do have paid accounts at both of these places, but everything that we're going to do today is within the free versions of these programs. So you don't have to pay any money in order to be able to use these applications. Now, as you're working on that, let me tell you a little bit about my initial experience with AI. It all began with my son coming home from school one day and telling me, Dad, there's this new stuff out there and it'll do your homework. And I was like, what are you talking about, right? I thought he had just like found some site on Google and he's like, no, Dad, it's called ChatGPT and it will do your homework. And like many of you, I initially, uh, upon hearing the description, thought this is the worst thing ever. The world is ending, oh my goodness. And uh, then we created an account and yes, it would do some of the things, but we started looking at some of the other uh, things about it. And, it and it was so interesting how it would just talk to you right you could ask a question and it would respond in sentences and it was like exchanging text messages with somebody and and so we asked you know like tell me a joke or or we'd ask who was the 1986 uh nba slam dunk contest champion or say you know just like random trivia questions and and then we're like oh well maybe we can ask questions about opinions what's your favorite taylor swift song and and i mean how could you even pick something like that right that's that's unchoosable and we got bored with it quickly, if I'm honest. It wasn't really all that helpful of a tool. We kind of just put it aside and thought, well, that's unique, but I don't know that we're going to know how to use it. And over the next few months, I've dove in a little bit more and really over the last 18 months, I've been learning more and more about how to use these tools. And that to me is what they are, is they are tools. I, I took a walk around my neighborhood this morning before work, and uh, there's some houses that are being built in the area. And I gotta tell you, all of these construction workers that were framing up these houses, they were all using nail guns, right? Big, huge, air compressed nail guns. I didn't see a single one of them that had a framing hammer out there and was like, we are going to build this house solely with a hammer and nails by hand. Imagine for just a moment if you were having a house built and that was the contractor you hired. They said, we would love to build your house, but we got to tell you right now, everything we do is with hammer and nails. You might be intrigued at first. You might even think, well, that's kind of unique in today's day and age. And I want to see more about this. But over time, you would probably start to wonder, have they heard about the nail gun? I mean, it's cool that they want to use the hammer and nails, but they do know that there are some really good tools out there, right, that can accomplish the same task and that could actually help them get done more efficiently and faster. Do they know about the nail gun? Well, today, my friends, when we talk about these chat programs, I think they're going to be a bit like a nail gun for you. If you haven't used them, then they are going to help you do some of the things that you do day in and day out, and they are going to help you do them quicker better and help you get on to the things that you feel the most called to do. Now, this is one of those things that I love talking about here at SCS, particularly our seminary where we work, because SCS includes as one of our learning outcomes, one of the things that we hope all of our students accomplish and do by the time that they graduate is that they will be able to demonstrate digital fluency. And several years ago, that looked a little bit different. When I first started, it was, uh, can you turn in something using Google Docs? That was a big deal, right? You don't have to print out anything anymore. You can just turn in a digital version of a document. And then over time that changed and we started using video conferencing more and more long before the pandemic in order to connect our multiple locations and students from all over the place. And so that became digital fluency. And now today we find ourselves in a world where AI is becoming more and more prevalent. And we are trying to find ways in which we can be proactive and use these tools in appropriate ways and that's one of the things that makes me most proud about our seminary is that we are always looking for how we can help our students demonstrate digital fluency. Now I realize I've said AI multiple times and we could probably do another poll real quick about what does AI mean to you? And all of us might have a different answer about what AI is. For some of us, AI is 
this is when robots become human and human become robots and and it's all this mixing of things that makes us all feel a little weird and feels like it's straight out of a movie for some of us ai might just be as simple as siri in our pocket or the alexa device that we have at home it's something that we can talk to like one of those digital assistants or maybe ai is any number of algorithms that exist in social media or on google or anywhere else that kind of direct uh you know our attention and focus and the truth is all of those have some aspects of ai but for our conversation today what we're going to be focusing in is on one particular slice of ai and that is the large language model chat and that's what chat gpt and claude both are is they are large language model chats now as we think about how we can use them i want to be upfront about a few things as we get started first off AI excels at a couple of things. You may be the biggest skeptic, but AI is really good at two particular things. One is invention. That is, if you need to generate some ideas, if you need to brainstorm, if you're looking at a blank page and you've got to come up with something, AI is so good at that. AI is also very good at iteration. That is taking ideas that you already have and then turning them into something else, improving upon them. And AI, you will find, is good at both of these things. But AI kind of fails at some other things. First off, AI fails at wonder. You see, I believe that we were created in the image of God. That is, we are given his creative spirit. And so we're always going to have something that a piece of technology won't have. And that is, we have been given God's creative spirit within us. We are created in his image, which means when it comes to the, the topic of wonder or pondering the big questions, the big opportunities in life, we are always going to be better at that than AI. And so we shouldn't come to technology to do that, to function in the way that God has created us to function. But also AI fails at completing a task. We're going to look at some things today, even something as simple and mundane as helping you write an email. And the fact is AI is not going to write that email in your email browser and send it off for you. It won't finish the task. You can use it to generate ideas, but you are still going to have to do something with whatever it is you ask it to generate. Now, the other thing that can be complicated for many of us on the topic of AI, so we might wonder, is it okay to use AI? And some of us might first wonder, you know, ethically, is it right to use AI? That might be one of the questions that we would ask. For some others, we might say, well, I actually have legal questions and, and there's things about you know uh, producing ideas and the, the material that it's read and there's lawsuits that are out there that haven't been settled, but we might have legal questions about, is it okay to use AI? And then for others of us, we might just have contextual questions. You know, I, I, I think it's okay. I understand there's not legal challenges, but I have to ask in my context, in my congregation, maybe in my class, SCS students, is it okay to use AI? And we could spend, again, hours talking about all of those things, but I wanna give you one question that I think might help you cut through some of that personally in your use of AI. And it is this, is can I be 100% honest about my use of AI? As we look at all of these examples and we talk about the ways in which it can help you brainstorm and generate some ideas and go through all of these things, you wanna ask yourself, if somebody else from my congregation if somebody else from my church or my workplace was right here and they knew exactly how much i had used ai in this instance would i be okay with that or do i feel the need to lie or hide or or, or pretend like i didn't use ai and if any of those things are true you might want to reconsider your use of ai i have found that I can be honest with my congregation about AI. In fact, they promoted this event on our Instagram. They know that I like using AI, but I tell them what I use AI for, not highlighting everything, but they know that I use it for brainstorming, that I use it for uh, a multiple, uh, multiple tasks throughout my work as a pastor. And I think that's a question you need to wonder is, can I be 100% honest about my use of AI? Because friends, there's everything to gain when there's nothing to hide. So with that, we're going to kind of start talking now about how we use the tools. But as we do that, I'm going to turn it over to Cheryl. Cheryl's got another poll that we are going to take really quickly in YouTube. And so Cheryl, take it away for a minute. Yes. So I've just placed another poll in the chat there on YouTube. Where do you think you can use AI the most in your ministry setting? Uh, so maybe administrative tasks that is a big one that could be emails uh it could be following up maybe with visitors at your church creating a social media management 
uh, system, or maybe improving accuracy or reviewing themes. Uh, you could make sure that you never misspell a Bible name ever again, like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I still don't know that I have those clear in my mind how to spell them. Maybe brainstorming ideas or uh, event planning or content. Uh, so maybe taking your sermon, generating additional content from what you've already done. Uh, that's maybe something that you could use it for as well. So it seems like we're getting a lot of administrative tasks seems to be the the main one, I'm going to go ahead and we're going to end this poll right now. And yeah, that's a lot of what we're going to cover today is administrative and brainstorming ideas. So we're glad you're connected and we'll go ahead and start getting into the hands on part. Yeah, and that's great. Administrative tasks are one of the ways in which this will really shine for you. And so um, when you sign on to either one of these, hopefully you've already done that. Maybe you're using the app on your phone or a web browser. You're going to see some version of this. And both programs are going to be similar because they have a text box at the bottom where you are going to have to enter in some type of question or prompt. And this is where a lot of times it breaks down uh, the usefulness of these tools because we aren't great at designing a prompt. And that's what we're gonna help you learn how to do today is how to design a prompt that will get you results that you want. And really, when it comes to designing your prompt, there's three things you should keep in mind. First, you should define your perspective. That is, who is asking the question? Second, you ought to define your goal. What is it that you actually want as a result? And third, you can actually prompt the AI to ask you questions if your prompt is vague. Okay, so perspective, goal, ask questions. Let's look at what that looks like within a prompt. So I want you to consider an example. If you were in ChatGPT and you just typed in this question, how can we attract more college students? Okay, that's an okay question. Maybe that's something that you might be wondering at your church. But from the AI perspective, this is not a very good prompt because we haven't defined our perspective. Who is the we? Are we talking about a church? Are we talking about a college ministry? Are we talking about a college recruiter? Um, who is it that is trying to actually attract more college students? And we haven't really given a very good goal. What does that mean, attract college students? So what if we tried to improve our prompt in this way? And we said, I am a pastor at a church. What ideas can you give me for inviting college students to our church? Okay, well, all of a sudden, that has become a much better prompt. Now we've given a perspective, and now we have clarified our goal. What ideas can you give me? But we can even go a step further. What about this prompt? I'm a pastor at a church and we have a college in our town. Okay, so we've better identified our perspective. Now we're gonna ask it to put yourself in the shoes of an 18 to 25 year old person who attends college, but has not gone to church in a while. You know anybody like that? Yeah, we probably all do, right? Okay, so we want this, the results to be in that vein of thinking from that perspective. What would be ideas for inviting that type of person to our church and ask me more questions if it will help get a better result? You see, we're going to get much better ideas that we can then ask further questions from this prompt than we would have from the very first question, what are ideas for attracting college students? Well, that could lead you down any number of roads. What about this example? If you just typed into Claude, please write me an article about John chapter 13. It would. And, and it would probably be fine and it would be a little generic and, and that would be okay. But it's not probably what you are looking for. I bet if you were wondering about an article on John chapter 13, you probably have some more specific ideas. So what about improving the prompt this way? This is iteration. So if you said, I preached a sermon on John 13, so you've already got your sermon manuscript written, your outline, it's all developed. And you said, take the manuscript below and I want you to turn it into a 300 word article that I could post on our church website. So you've already produced the sermon. You just wanna take the sermon and now shorten it down into something that you might be able to put on a blog or a Substack or something like that. And then you can take what you've already done and turn it into something else. That's iteration. Let's go one step further though with it. What if you said I preached a sermon on John 13 I want you to take the manuscript and turn it into a 300 word devotional that could be shared with elementary school children during a chapel service. 
Okay, so now we're taking something that you produce for one environment and saying, I, I want to use it again, but I just want to kind of reconfigure it for this different environment. Now, when we'll do the live demonstrations in just a moment, you'll see this. Rarely am I using everything it's giving me right out of the gate as is. I will have to edit, I'll have to make some adjustments, but it is a great place to begin the process to look at the idea that it produces. And frequently there are some things that I would have never come up with on my own. And yet the chat program is able to help me generate more ideas by using a prompt just like this. So to recap, invention and iteration, and this is what AI programs do the best. Invention is anytime you need ideas, plans, questions, analogies, alternatives, topics, all those things. And iteration is when you want to rewrite something or I need to take this long thing that I've produced and summarize it down into a few short sentences. Or maybe I've got this, this example and I just, I wanna reword it into something else. How could I do that? Or maybe even something like captions or descriptions for YouTube or Instagram. Those are all really great ways to use AI. And it all starts with this, a prompt, where you define your perspective, you define your goal, and sometimes you can ask it to ask you questions. Okay, so let's look at some live examples of this. So this is my chat GPT, uh, and I'm just gonna type out some questions. You could do the exact same thing and ask these questions. The wording is not magic. I'm just gonna show you how I would frame some questions. And I'm gonna start with a scenario where help me write an email to my professor to meet, to discuss the research paper assignment. I want to meet in person. I can also meet via Google Meet. What other details should I include? Okay, so some of those, some of y'all who are students have probably had this dilemma where you want to ask a professor to meet, but you're just like, I don't even know how to start that email. Well, AI is a great way to begin that process. So we're gonna ask it to help me write an email. You'll notice I misspelled email. It's not gonna matter. It will know and be able to work right through that. So let's see what we get. Okay, so it gives me a subject, request for meeting to discuss research paper assignment. Dear professor, I hope this email finds you well. I'm writing to request a meeting to discuss the research paper and you can see all of these details. I'll let you read on. But you'll notice it's very organized. It's very well thought out. In our meeting, I would like to discuss the following points. Maybe those are the points that you'd like to discuss. Maybe you want to edit them and you want to change them. But okay, this gives us an email that then is organized. It sounds good. We could take that, adapt it, put in some things that we need. But maybe we don't really like the tone. So this is a way that you can even improve your results. So let's ask ChatGPT this. Can you write it in a more professional and formal tone? And again, misspelled doesn't matter. So now let's see what it says. I am reaching out to respectfully request a meeting with you to discuss the intricacies of the research paper assignment for R and you add your course name with the submission deadline drawing near. I deem it essential. I don't know that that's my voice. Maybe that's your voice. Uh, there might be some phrases in there that I'd want to use, but you can see it changed the email, still same basic content, but it updated it to be more professional. What about this? Can you write it in a more friendly and chatty tone? All right, let's see now what it says. I bet it has emojis. There it is. All right. <laughs> Hope you're doing awesome, Star. I'm reaching out because I can use your expertise and guidance. I'm totally flexible on how we meet, whether it's grabbing coffee or chatting in person. I don't know that this is the voice I would want to use if I was emailing my professor either. But Frequently, you probably find yourself in a situation where you need to email someone and you're not even sure how to get that email off the ground. How do I start this? What's the wording that I should use? Chat is a great way to do something even as mundane as writing an email. Now, let's take all of this. We've shown you how you can write an email using a prompt. Then we've shown you how you can write it in different tones, but you can also do this. Instead of an email, I would like to send a comment in Google Classroom. Please rewrite the email in two sentences that I could post online. Here's a condensed version. Okay, so you realize, you know what, an email is probably not all that helpful, and then it takes that. 
Now, I bet all of you could have come up with that email. I bet all of you could come up with that comment. But do you see how in the span of what, 90 seconds, we've now gotten multiple versions. We've seen some different wording. And sometimes when you're writing a really crucial and important email, it's nice to have some things that you can pull from and edit. It's a very, very helpful use of ChatGPT. Now, one thing to notice if you are using ChatGPT, up here in the upper right corner, there's a little arrow pointing up. And when you click on that, you can actually share a link to this chat, which means when you work on these things, if you needed to share it with somebody else, you can copy the link and then email that or text it to somebody else. So very helpful. Now, let's switch to a different. We're going to actually use Claude now, and I'm going to show you one of the things that Claude can do. So uh, I want you to imagine that you want to create a survey for first time visitors at your church. And so I'm going to word it this way. I want to create a survey that we can send to all first time visitors to our church. But I don't know what questions to ask. Okay, I'm going to say something about a church that I'm just thinking of in my head. Uh, our church is multi-generational and typically has five to seven new families visit each month. We have been around for 75 years. Please give me a list of 20 questions I could ask. Okay, so here are 20 potential questions that you could ask on a survey for first time visitors. Now, maybe you want to use all 20 of those and they're helpful. Things like, did you feel welcome, accepted, regardless of your background? How would you rate the cleanliness? Maybe those are all helpful. But let's see now if we can cut through all 20. If we were only going to use five questions, what would be the best five? Let's ask it its top five questions. Okay. So it helped to generate some, maybe you like those five, maybe you would even change them up further. Maybe some of the wording doesn't quite fit your context and, and you might wanna add in instead of how did we hear about our church? How did you hear about it? And then put your actual church's name. Now let's, let's actually try and get some opinion though from the AI. What are the advantages and disadvantages of making this survey anonymous? This is something we often think about. Is it good to make a survey anonymous? Let's see what this would have to say. Okay, so advantages of anonymous is that it's gonna have increased honesty, higher response rate, unbiased feedback, privacy protection. I mean, some disadvantages though are here. Now, this question is unique to me as a prompt in the AI because you know how I typically would have asked that question? I would have asked it in Google, right? I would have gone to Google and said, should surveys at churches be anonymous? And I would have clicked on site after site after site to eventually get a list that looks very similar to this. And so this actually was a shortcut around having to make a Google search and look through a whole bunch of sites. It gives me some ideas that I can then think through. And maybe some of these are, well, yeah, I thought about that one, but then I was like, oh, I didn't think about that one over here. Like the potential for duplicate responses. Somebody could just be spamming your survey all day long. Now let's go back to our questions and say, you know what I just thought of? Some of the people who visit our church actually speak Spanish and I'd love to send them a version. What's great about AI is that it works with languages and it can work with more than just English. I want to translate those top five questions into a Spanish version. Use Spanish that would be familiar to Spanish speakers in South Texas. Now, this is the part of the webinar where things break down because I can't tell you if that is honestly the best way of phrasing these questions. I wish that I was fluent in Spanish, but you know what I have seen is that we do have people around Stark who have to do translating work for us from time to time. And one of the things that I've heard from them is that it is much easier to edit a phrase here and there than it is to have to translate word for word at the start. And so when you use something like this to then translate those, you could hand that to somebody who is a fluent speaker and they can probably tell you, yeah, that's probably not the right word. That one doesn't make sense. Or I might change this a little bit and it will be a much easier process. Now, let's go one more step and try and generate again another opinion and say, if we wanted to offer some type of gift under 
five dollars for anyone who completes the survey what are some ideas and look it's going to help you brainstorm oh well, you could give a gift card you could give some church branded items you could give snacks or treats maybe a pocket devotional book maybe a pack of nice note cards maybe a reusable grocery tote you see all of those things and that's just a few ideas we could keep asking for more give me more ideas give me more ideas i don't like those what if we had ten dollars to spend we could keep going on and on and it will help you brainstorm ideas around something even as simple as a survey i'm going to hop back to chat gpt for just a moment i'm going to do one more live example and then show you a few others but this is real life stuff i am working on my sermon for this Sunday at Third Coast Church in Corpus Christi. Man, I'm doing bad on typing today. And one of the verses talks about an anchor. What are the different uses for anchors in life? Okay, so it's gonna give me the metaphorical significance of anchors. Huh, and so as I look at this, I'm like, okay, yeah, stability and security, I thought about that, guidance and direction, rest and restoration. You know, I, I hadn't necessarily thought about that, that when you drop an anchor, it's gonna give you some pause and rest in the journey. Or what about a connection to the past, that it is the sense of tradition, strength and resilience, huh? So all of a sudden, it has helped me to generate some ideas some images maybe some things that i can be thinking about as i'm working on my sermon i'm going to ask can you give me a list of bible verses that include an anchor or something related to anchors hebrew 6 is the verse that i'm using there's acts 27 that's paul's journey and so then we have some other ones, ah, but you know what? Let's say you don't use the NIV. Can you give me those verses in ESV? Oh, look, it'll do that. And you could use that for NAS, King James, uh, you know, Holman Christian Standard or the, the Christian Standard Bible. You could use it for any of those things and it will give you the different versions. But I wanna ask one more question because trying to think of like an analogy and how to word something, and I, it's like it's on the tip of my tongue. How does an anchor help me conceptualize hope? Please give me an analogy that would make sense to a, I'm just gonna pick a teenager for a minute, okay? So a 15 year old um, that connects those ideas i could say you know a 40 year old i could say a business owner i could say a mom i could say a five-year-old but i'm just gonna pick a 15 year old for a minute and we'll see what it says so help a 15 year old conceptualize how an anchor represents hope consider using the analogy of a kite flying in the wind imagine you're flying the kite on a windy day at the beach it soars high into the sky but suddenly a strong gust of wind comes along we know about that here in corpus christi threatening to carry the kite away now think of the kite string as your anchor and the kite itself as your hope. As the wind picks up and tries to whisk your kite away, you hold tight to the string, keeping it firmly anchored to the ground. Despite the powerful wind, the anchor holds fast, preventing the kite from being lost. Maybe that is a helpful analogy. It's probably not one that I would use and I might wanna reframe it. But again, as you're trying to brainstorm, sometimes when you're stuck with just a blank page of like, I don't know exactly where to go, chat becomes a great way to help you generate some ideas. Let's look at a few more ideas uh, and some ways that we can use chat. I'm gonna switch back to our slideshow. So here are some real prompts that I have used over the years. Um, I've taken my sermon manuscript and then used that to then create the description in our YouTube videos. So I want it to be intriguing. I want it to create interest. Uh, and in this particular instance, I used an actual begin it this way because that sermon was about community. And so you can take something that you've already made, you can copy and paste it um, into the program, and then you can have it generate something else. In this case, a YouTube description. Here's another thing. I was meeting as part of a pastor's cohort with some other pastors, and they wanted us to submit questions. 
what are some good questions that I could ask? And uh, it gave me some and I asked for more and went back and forth. This one's probably the best, right? Please make a list of every Bible verse that could be used in a fantasy football league to console someone who has underperformed and is having a hard time coping with their mediocrity. We don't teach a class here at Stark on how to you know, extract Bible verses in that way, but that's why chat is really handy. Um, no, it, it was a silly thing. I really didn't want to spend a lot of time and I was just looking for something that I could uh, laugh along with my fantasy football league mates uh, and so used it for that. But here's a real example. My daughter called me one day and she needed some help because she had a PDF document and she needed to make it something that could have text boxes, fillable text boxes. So normally we'd use Google, right? And you'd have to look through all these help documents and you go through stuff. Instead, we jumped right into chat. I asked it this question and it gave me step-by-step -step instructions on how to make this happen in Adobe Acrobat. Saved us a lot of time, answered the question directly, very, very helpful. Let me show you a few more, and we're just going to kind of whip through these uh, pretty quickly. I'm not going to read through all of them, but just want to show you some other things. So one time in chat, I said, I'm a pastor at a Baptist church in Texas. I'm working on sermon preparation about the resurrection of Jesus, and I would like to think about unusual perspectives and ideas about the resurrection. What are some unusual ideas that exist? And it gave me this list. And honestly, these were not helpful. This is not what I wanted at all. Like this, this was kind of silly. I wanted ideas that actually were within the Bible, unique perspectives, maybe things, because I kind of felt like I was in a rut and I only think about it from one vantage point. So help me think about some new uh, ideas or perspectives. So I changed my prop. So that's okay. But I was thinking about unique perspectives that exist within the Bible. And so it gave me this list, resurrection as first fruits, resurrection and new creation. And I decided I was going to chase down just one of those ideas. Resurrection is first fruits. So here's what I said. I want to explore the first fruits idea. I serve at a church with a significant number of people who work in business. And I want an analogy that would make sense to a college educated business person to explain the concept of resurrection as first fruits. So here's what it said. Imagine a business that has been struggling for years, facing challenges and setbacks. The owner against all odds implements a strategic plan plan that transforms the company. The first phase of this transformation involves a pilot project, a small but impactful initiative that showcases the potential for success. And you can see how it then breaks apart the analogy and the metaphor to say, here's what all of those things represent. I didn't use that, but that was a really interesting concept. So I went even another step forward and said, instead, give me something that would make sense to an elementary age student. I thought that concept was too lofty. And so instead, it talked about a garden where you plant different seeds. And it's that very first flower that blooms, how special that is, the literal first fruits. And so again, in brainstorming, I'm not using ChatGPT to write my sermons. And so maybe that's one of the big concerns you have is like, oh, this is just a way to get out of having to write a sermon or having to write a paper. Not for me at all. I still write all of the content myself. But I use this like a brainstorming friend that I can call at any moment, and they have unlimited ideas to offer with me. So I'll go back and forth asking questions, thinking about something. Well, what about this word? Well, is there something else? And it becomes a great research partner to enhance all the things I'm already doing through my own personal study, through reading, through commentaries. Very useful tool. Now, one of the things I love about Claude is Claude has a little, let me actually go back to Claude real quick. I'm gonna share this tab. And you can see how Claude down here has a little paperclip option where you can actually upload documents and it will read through them for you. So PDFs or Word documents, and it can actually read through them and then give you information and summarize information. So it's a really handy uh, feature of Claude. Again, that's available on the free version. So I taught a class on ministry finance uh, at Stark and I had created some fictitious statements of financial activities. And so I took one of them and put it in here and just said, here's the statement of financial activities. This was a made up church, made up document. And I said, I'm not good at reading financial information. What's the most important data that I should take away from this? And maybe this is an area where you feel limited and you don't have a good grasp. Well, these tools can actually help you cut through all of the complicated information and summarize it for you in a way that you can actually do something with it. Uh, one more, um, I also put into Claude, 
a giving letter. Uh, many of you probably do this where you send to maybe people who are tithing at your church or if you work at a nonprofit, donor letters, things like that. Well, I took that letter and said, this is a year-end giving letter we're sending to donors. What critiques do you have? What suggestions for improvement? And it actually critiqued and enhanced that letter. I, I'm not going to show you this one, but I actually took my PhD dissertation and dropped it in Claude and asked it what critiques it had. Yeah, it had a lot of really good ones. Where was Claude when I was actually going through my doctoral work? It would have helped. But again, this is a way you've already made something. How can I improve it? How can I critique it? How can I make it better? So when it comes to building a prompt, here's some things you can keep in mind and you can take a screenshot of this or come back to it later. But when it comes to your perspective, things like I'm a pastor, maybe I'm a marketing director, take the position of someone who believes this, imagine that you are, so on and so forth. And when it comes to your goals, maybe you want something like a 300 word article or a YouTube description or an analogy, or you want a critique, or what are questions I could ask, or here, give me a six month marketing plan for this event that we have coming up, or create a policy document. Maybe compare these two essays that I have and, and see which one is stronger between the two. And maybe you could even add things like, can you include goals and deliverables for every week of the campaign? I've done this before where I'm like, we have an event coming up in two months, and I wanna figure out a marketing strategy, and give me goals and deliverables for every week of that marketing campaign. I've used it to write SEO, search engine optimization friendly uh, language. Uh, I love this one right there in the middle. The step-by-step -step plan should be easy enough to understand that I can give it to a volunteer with no additional training needed. So write me a step-by-step -step plan for whatever project is going on and make it so simple that I could just hand it to a volunteer and they'd be able to take it and run with it. Maybe you include all the ideas you give me should cost less than $50 or $100. Uh, you can even ask it, put the results in a tabular format and it will categorize them all in like a mini spreadsheet for you. So all of these things are just the building blocks. They're the beginning. As you use these programs more and more, you're going to find uh, even better ways to use them. Let me show you a few other apps and then I'm gonna turn it over to Cheryl to kind of wrap up our time together. But we talked about chat and Claude. There are other chat apps that exist, things like Perplexity, Gemini from Google, uh, Bing has a chat if you wanted to use any of those. There's even some other crazy tools. I put dollar signs next to these because they do cost, but HeyGen will translate videos that you have into another language. So you take you speaking English and translate it into Spanish, it's pretty wild. Eleven Labs, you can take something that you've recorded of your voice and then turn that into text to speech. And it's really fun. And there are just some great uh, things out there. It's crazy to see all these things. Uh, as far as photo and video go, Descript is a AI based photo editing. So it will make transcripts and you can then delete something out of the transcript and it will delete that portion of the video. It's pretty wild. Again, it costs. Remini is a photo enhancer. So it's interesting, you could take like a screenshot of your live stream from your church, run it through Remini, and it will turn it into a higher quality version of it. And maybe that's what you use then as your thumbnail for your YouTube stream. Opus Clip, you can put in your sermon recording, it will then chop up that recording into short, like 60 second clips. But one of my favorites is Mid Journey. And Mid Journey is the only tool that I pay for regarding AI, and it's because I love using it. It is for generating photos. And for me, this has been such a boost of creativity. And I want to show you one example. We were doing a sermon uh, series through Abraham, and we got to the point uh, in which the visitors come to see Abraham and Sarah's listening at the door. And this was the, te the prompt that I gave it is a, I wanted a photorealistic 8K image of an Old Testament Jewish character, Sarah, listening at the door of a tent. And I loved this image. Man, it just made it so much more powerful to me but to see Sarah as an old woman, because every time I read all of these stories, I always imagine everybody looks just like me. And this picture helped me to step outside of my vantage point and instead to think about what Sarah might have looked like. And then there's one other fun version I'll show you. Uh, I took all of our staff photos uh, at SCS and I turned them into Pixar style. And so you can see uh, what Cheryl or Dr. GM or Dr. Garcia, uh, we got Curtis. He's, he looks a little like Chadwick Boseman to me in that, but uh, I think I don't know if that's an upgrade. Curtis is a good looking guy uh, either way, but um, this was a way, uh, just again, fun things you can do with Mid Journey. That's a whole other Bible study of things that we can go through sometime. 
But all that to say, there are some great tools out there and I love using them. And I hope today that you have learned a couple of things that you might be able to use as well. Cheryl, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Stapper. Uh, these are great tools. We've had a little bit of activity in the chat. Of uh, Someone had asked the question about word limits or character limits for ChatGPT and Claude. Um, I personally have a paid version of chat. And so uh, when you have a paid version, you can upload documents. And I have yet to run into an issue where it's been too large of a document. <laughs> so I don't know the exact um, max on that and these things change regularly too uh but if you have yeah. the paid version go ahead Dr. Shepard, do you want to say something well so one of the great things about both of these programs is they're very transparent so you can actually ask that question within chat gpt and so i just asked it um here I'm, i'll share this screen what are the word or character limits in chat gpt and it tells you right here 4096 tokens and that i'm uh for both but that's not a very clear answer. So let's ask it. I mean, how much text can I put in one prompt? And of course, it's going to take a while now. This is great. This is a live stream, y'all. This is really <laughs> happening as we go. Um, oh, there you go. Including ChatGPT is 2008. That means you can put 2048 tokens of text, which equates to about 2048 words at a time. So uh, if you were pasting an entire manuscript, that means you could have about 2000 words that you could paste in there. But when you have questions like that, this is a great moment. You can actually ask ChatGPT and Claude and they will tell you. So if you want to know where they're getting their information, they'll tell you. And so you can, uh, it's like having an instruction manual that you can interact with. That is awesome. Yes, if you ever just run into a question, it's like having your own intern <laughs> that doesn't have feelings, that you don't have to worry about their feelings. <laughs> so just ask it yourself, it's questions. Dr. Stepper, as we wrap up, I wanna ask you just one last question. Um, how has this helped you the most in ministry? You are a local pastor, we mentioned that earlier. How has it really been a game changer for you? Yeah. Um, so for me, I heard somebody describe um, these AI programs as a drudgery mop. And that to me is the best description of them is there are these things that we don't always love doing, but need to get done. And they can feel a little bit like a drudge, right? Like drudgery. This helps you cut through all those things and get to the things that you love doing. So sometimes I'll even use it to say like, hey, I, I want to text people who have visited to our church. Can you give me six weeks of text messages that I can send back and forth? And it will generate those for me. You see, for me, it's not that initial text that I care that much about. It's the follow up text. It's when they respond and then we get to go back and forth. That's what I love. But so many times I find myself like, well, I don't know even how to get this conversation started. And I could spend all day thinking and overthinking. And it helps me cut through that and instead get to the thing that I love doing, which is actually being able to connect, build relationships and point people to Jesus. And so that's been the thing that has been the most helpful for me is it just cuts through a lot of those things that can sometimes feel like a drudgery. Yes, and that way we can focus more on building relationships, shepherding people, doing all the things that you wanna focus on in ministry. Well, we are coming to the end of our time here. And so, yes, thank you for sharing that, Dr. Schaffer. We do have a survey here that uh, we would like you to fill out. There's a QR code there. We're also going to send you an email after this event that includes the links to the tools that Dr. Schaffer went over with us today. So you will have access to that. You should also be able to have access to this video uh, in the future as well. And then we'll include this survey and you'll be entered to win a Chick-fil-A gift card if you fill that out. So please let us know how this went. Uh, our heart at Stark here is to better equip people to serve their churches and communities. And so the primary way we do that is by offering Bible classes, but we also do events like these. And so we want to do more of these and let us know what you think, how we can improve on them and what other topics that you are interested in learning more about in the future. Uh, I'm going to drop this survey in the chat so you can access it immediately if you want to. Uh, or again, if you don't get it today, it's okay. We're going to send it in an email to you. So you'll be able to fill out that survey and hopefully win the Chick-fil-A gift card. So thank you again, Dr. Stapper, for presenting 
on these tools. We really appreciate you for doing this. We hope you learned something during this event, everyone. Thank you for participating. Uh, and again, we look forward to seeing you at a future Stark event. God bless.